No more fragments. No fragments. The flowchart. Let me really quickly... Let me try this one last time. I know that I've already tried putting in Sean before, but I don't know. Sean, no. Chris, no. Maria, no. Kyle, no. I don't know what other name I could put here. Q? Input Q's name. So it's not Sean, apparently. Gab. He is not here. Um. Okay, so I just don't know this, apparently. Alright, there's nowhere... You know what? I have an idea. Uh, let's go back. Let me... Ah! Alright, let me read through the last of the files here. Okay. The other Phi. Baby Phi was indeed transported from 1904 to 2008, but a Phi also remained in 1904. Whatever happened to that Phi? Rumor is she became a brilliant scientist and worked at a research facility in the U.S. well into one hun her 100s. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where... Wait a minute. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where the Phi from 1904 is sent. Wait, what? Does that continue? That doesn't continue. But a Phi remained in 1904. Whatever happened to that Phi? Rumor it became a brilliant scientist worked at a research facility well into her 100s. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where the Phi from 1904 is sent. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where the Phi from 1904 is sent. Rumor as she became a brilliant scientist and worked at a research facility well into her 100s. Facility was researching the transporter. And that's where the Phi from 1904 is sent. Okay, so basically she lived a normal life. She lived through time normally from 1904 to 2008. Facility was researching the transporter, and that's where the Phi from 1904. So there are two Phi's. There's a super old Phi, and then there's a, a young Phi that we know. What? We've not seen an, an, an old Phi. Okay. Carlos. The day is bright and clear. A girl in a white dress strolls along the beach, the wind tossing her long blonde hair playfully. Up until a half a year ago, she had been confined to a bed. Carlos's eyes still tear up every time he sees her smile. Come on, Carlos, you don't always have to help me. Uh, that's the point of my rehab. You're, you're right. I'm sorry, uh, Maria. Carlos brushes her hair out of her face. It's definitely not the summer sun that's making him act out of sorts. It's the fact that his sister is here standing before him. Maria grins up at him. What would Akane and Junpei say if they saw you being all fussy like this? It's fine. They understand how important you are to me. Both you and Junpei put your lives on the line. That was a different history, but going through that means we know how to treat reverie syndrome. I can't believe that we have the ability to... We have the ability to jump through space-time? Going through that uh, means we know how to treat reverie syndrome. I can't, so Maria is saying, I can't believe we have the ability to jump through space-time. Maria can do this? I'm just glad you're able to control it now. It's all because Carlos met Akane and Junpei that Maria was able to recover. He wishes he could show them just how well she's doing. 
I can't believe we have the ability to... Was that Carlos saying that? Because that, that would make sense. It would have made sense that Maria would say that. I'm just glad you're able to control it now. We have the ability. Can Maria jump through space-time? You're thinking about them right now, aren't you, Carlos? What makes you say that? Because you're smiling. Carlos closes his eyes and his unconscious smile turns fond. They're just about your age. It kind of feels like I gained a brother and a, a young... It kind of feels like I gained a brother and another sister. You are going to their wedding, aren't you? Yeah, and you're coming with me. But there is something Carlos needs to do first. Back when the three of them parted ways, I'll be waiting to hear word from you when you locate that terrorist. When you locate that terrorist? Carlos held his right hand outward. Carlos held his right hand out towards Akane and Junpei, and the other two grabbed onto it with their own. There was no way of knowing if Delta was telling the truth, but if he was, one fanatic would kill off all of humanity. Akane and Junpei vowed to find this person, and Carlos offered to help. I'll be waiting to hear word from when you locate that terrorist. You can still feel the strong bond between the three of them, their hands clasped together tightly. I suppose I better get used to talking more before the weddings. Huh. Holding out, holding her hair out of her face, Maria reaches out to her brother, who takes her hand in his, and they continue walking down the beach. The same blue sky over them stretches over... The same blue sky stretches over friends Carlos knows he can rely on. Okay, so they're just looking for the terrorist now who's supposed to kill everyone. And they're all working together, I guess, and Akane and Junpei are getting married now. Okay, that's a nice ending for them. Junpei sits upon a white sofa somewhere within a, the secret location of Crash Keys, twiddling a pen and sighing. Hmm, what else should I say? Laying on the table in front of him is a half-written letter. Suddenly, Akane pops behind him. What are you doing, Junpei? She playfully teases. Junpei dives for the letter, but she snatches it from his fingers and begins reading. Let's see. Carlos, without you, Akane and I uh, would have never gotten together. Thank you. Is this an invitation to the wedding? No, it's most definitely not. He makes a grab for the paper, but Akane quickly moves it out of his reach. It's just a pr it's just a progress report, Junpei mutters. Okay, yeah, I mentioned I mentioned the wedding, but the date hasn't been set yet. I made a promise to you and your brother. Oh, he met up with Aoi. Okay, so now he's a part of Crash Keys. I made a promise to you and your brother. We wouldn't get married until we've dealt with the fanatic. Akane's face flushes bright red. She hastily hides her face behind the letter and goes back to reading. I'd like nothing more than to get the approval and blessing of our old friends and those of you we met six months ago. Eyes wide, Akane glances up at Junpei. He avoids her gaze, awkwardly scratching the back of his head. That's the Junpei we know from 999. Okay. Ah. You know, there's a history where I keep searching for you. Even after I'm old and craggly, it still exists out there somewhere. And when I think of that, a sharp pain jolts through Junpei's face. Akane is pinching his cheek. Ow, that hurts. What are you doing? To prove to you that this isn't a dream. Akane giggles. You still can't believe we're together like this? Junpei shakes his head. You've changed a lot, Junpei. Uh, a half a year ago, you were never this honest. It's like, how do I want to describe it? Like a dream? Huh? Junpei leans in and quickly pinches Akane. Oh, now you've done it. She darts forward and goes after Junpei with both hands, getting in a pinch wherever she can. Junpei does the same. Once they start laughing, it's very hard to stop, and they keep going until they're out of breath. I guess this is all thanks to Carlos, too. That's why I'm writing him that thank you letter. On Akane's left hand, a ring glitters on her ring finger. Ah, okay, so they're definitely getting married, and um, they're just... Basically, everyone's just kind of holding off um, until... There are three. Holding off until they catch this terrorist guy. Hey, Mira, how are you feeling? Are you lonely? Come on, Eric. You visited last week. Eric's... Oh, uh, shit. Eric smiles wryly and reaches out to Mira with his left hand. Mira does the same, and their hands 
with matching silver rings align on either side of the plexiglass window. I brought a new guest to see you today. Eric shifts to the side and a head pops into view. You're, hi Amira, long time no see. It's Sean, right? Oh my God. Yep, I'm happy you remembered, but that's not my real name. My real name is something. Behind Mira, the sun is shining through an iron barred window lighting up the visitor room. It's been a long time, Sean. It's good to see you. The smile that appears on her face is real. Mira no longer needs to plaster on a fake one. Ah, when I heard you turned yourself in, I was really surprised. Eric was the one who convinced me. He said I should pay for my sins so we could be together. So that's why you got married in jail. Eric ducks his head shyly. Are you sure you're okay with this? Mira asks. He looks at her in confusion. Hmm. Don't you regret marrying me? I did carve your heart out in another history. Isn't that what you said, Sean? Yeah, you did. Eric looks Mira straight in the eye. I've already told you this a bunch of times. I forgive you, no matter what happens. Besides, you haven't killed me in this history yet, right? Yet, Mira's lips twist wryly. But the Heart Rippers killed people already. So many. Sean, stop it. Eric turns angrily on Sean and Mira's face falls into a frown, but Sean continues speaking. You turned yourself in, Mira, but that doesn't mean you've paid for all the crimes you did. I doubt the family and friends uh, that were left behind would forgive you even if you were put on death row. There's no way you can clear your sins here. Mira grits her teeth. But there is a way to clear them. Well, not what you've already done, technically. You'll have to pay for those your whole life. That will never change, but maybe you can in another universe. Oh. What? Suddenly, Sean's, fists, Sean's fist crashes through the plexiglass window. Mira jumps backward while Eric is frozen in shock. What are you? Eric can't even finish speaking before Sean moves, jumping through the broken window. He kicks the outside wall of the visitor room, causing it to crumble and reveal a giant hole. An alarm immediately starts blaring and police officers rush into the room, but Sean darts forward and takes them all down in the blink of an eye. What? He kills them? Or knocks them out, I guess, maybe. He holds out his hand to Mira. Let's go. Go where? I know where the transporter is being stored. You're saying we should go change history? Eric finally stutters. Sean nods to stop young Mira from committing murder. Mira, I'm pretty sure that's the only way you can clear your sins. Mira stares out through the hole in the wall at the horizon extended oh. beyond. Wait a minute, but if she does that, then that will change everything that happened in Zero Time Dilemma because Mira won't be here. Oh. I mean, that's a nice ending for Mira. Uh, we still don't know freaking Sean's real name. Um, uh... That's a nice ending for Mira, but again, that could change everything that happened in Zero Time Dilemma, which might or might not, which might be a bet. Oh my God, there's one more. What the fuck? Where? Damn it. That might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. Um, let's go back here. And did anything else open up now that I've read all of those files. I don't think so. Alright, you know what? Um, I definitely want to see what the fuck this is. So I'm going to cut the recording and uh, I'm going to I'm going to look this one up because I don't want to like dig through all of this shit I've seen. And um, yeah, I have no idea where it is. So I'm going to just uh, cheat and look and Google that last thing. So I'll be right back. Okay, guys, I'm back. Um, I just Googled something. I saw something really weird. Um, if this is really his name... Or you know what? Okay. I'm putting in Q here, right? Please input Q's name. So maybe the last one isn't even Q. What I saw... What? 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 Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on? Uh, I'm really sorry. I get it. I think I figured something out. I think I just figured something crazy out. 
Sean, you... Out of all your choices, you kill him? Adentum Forska Nuska Ova This is yet another destiny. Hmm. Percept per wait, perceptive end. Okay. Triangle, all sections cleared. And that should be it. Ah. Perceptive end. Let me, um... Latin phrase five. En ad dentem forsk venuscivat. A phrase from Ovid. It roughly translates to both love and luck help the blood. Both love and luck help the bold. Not the blood, the bold. Okay, so that's the last everything. I've gotten everything, I think. Have I gotten everything? I think I have. Oh, there's one stupid thing I never got. Well, that's probably not important. Let me see actually what room it was in. If I can figure that out. The study. Uh, okay. Yeah, there was one book that, uh, like one, um, I remember in the study there was one, one thing that I never got. One, um, like one book or something that I was supposed to like input into the chair and it would take out a book there. I don't know. But I think that's the last thing that I, I did not ever get. Okay. So. That's zero time dilemma. Holy frigging shit. This game is insane. Okay, so um, I do this at the ends of all of my Let's Plays. I just spend a while just talking about the game. You know what? Let me, um, let me actually do something. There we go. All right. So I am just going to stop this here, right on the flow chart. I'll, I'll stop it up here. All right. So I just wanted to get to, to um, a spot in the game that had this song playing in the background. This is my favorite song from 999. I love this song. I've spent many, many hours writing over the past few years just listening to this song on repeat. This is probably the song that I listen to, I have listened to most while writing. The 999 version of this song, of course. Okay. All right. Um, so I got a lot of things to say about this game. Um, Wow, where the fuck do I even start? Um, let's 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 start with the things that, I guess, speculation, um, things that weren't specifically addressed. And by the way, um, yeah, I I, I'm, I do this like a long ass just like session of me just talking about the game, a long ass discussion session of me just talking about the game at the ends of every LP that I do. Usually they're about an hour to an hour and a half in length. Um, Okay, so first thing is at the end of Virtue's Last Reward, it was mentioned by Akane that that Kyle would be playing a very important role in Zero Time Dilemma. Here's what I think. Before I started playing this game, I uh, I was just look I was doing research for Zero Time uh, not Zero uh, Part Zero of this LP, doing research for Virtue's Last Reward. And um, I saw something online. Somebody made a post in some forum that asked a particular question. And they were, I, I only saw the question, I didn't see the answer. I didn't see what anybody had to say about it. But the question was, is Kyle's consciousness inside of Gab? 
That's, I just saw that question. I didn't see the answer to it. I was, I hated that I'd even seen the question. So I've been, that had been in the back of my mind this entire LP. I thought that Gab would be like an important character and he kind of was sort of, but I thought I was really considering the possibility that, um, yeah, a human consciousness might be inhabiting an animal, which I had never thought of until I had seen that. Um, here's what I think though. I don't think, I don't think Gab's consciousness was inhabiting, I, I mean, uh, Kyle's consciousness was inhabiting Gab. I think Kyle's consciousness actually in some crazy way we know that he's Blickwinkle, right? And we saw this ending here. I just recorded this ending and this basically confirmed it, I think. Shoot Delta. We never see Delta at all. Except for we don't even see him here, but we, he, he first appears randomly in a cutscene where you're supposed to like identify who Zero is. He's just there. So <clears throat> he's been there the whole time as part of, he's part of Q Team, he's the fourth member of Q Team, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's ever mentioned that each team is only supposed to have three members. I don't think that's ever specifically said which would be hugely contradictory. Um, but the fact that we never see Delta throughout the whole LP kind of gives me the um, the impression that we're playing, whenever we're on Q Team, wherever, whenever we're playing, like through the perspective of, whenever we're seeing Q Team, we're doing something with Q Team, we're escaping a, a room or seeing cutscenes involving Q Team, <clears throat> It gives me the impression that we're seeing all of that through the eyes of Delta. We're seeing things through the eyes of Delta. Blickwinkle in German means point of view. We're seeing things through his point of view. Through his Blickwinkle. So I think... Kyle, who I think Kotaro Uchi, U, Uchikoshi, Kotaro Uchikoshi, who I think he confirmed that Kyle was Blickwinkle. I think Blickwinkle's, Blickwinkle's consciousness has been inside of Delta this whole time. Would that make sense, though? That would that 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 we saw this that when we got this ending, Q turned towards us like the player and shot quote unquote us that implies that delta was blickwinkle but he can't shift akane says something to kyle at the end of virtue's last reward and you have no idea how much the professor loves you or something like that oh my god i think i think i think i'm right about that Akane says to Kyle, you have, she says something like, you have no idea how much the professor loves you or some, something like that. Professor Sigma Climb, the father of Delta. So yeah, that, that fits. That fits in really well if Delta was actually Blickwinkle. That fits in perfectly well. I don't know if his inability to shift creates any weird contradictions because honestly the whole like shift mechanic is it's very hard to follow it's it's pretty it's pretty complicated um or maybe i'm just confused right i don't know but yeah it, it makes sense that delta would be that kyle's consciousness had moved into delta's body I can't think of anything that Delta said that really hints to that point. The only reason I think that really is because of this ending and because of the other part in the game where suddenly Delta appeared out of nowhere and nobody was surprised to see him. Okay, so that's what I think about that. At the end of Virtue's Last Reward, um, Akane also mentioned um, that it would be possible for Clover and Alice to be sent back in time. 
That I still don't really understand. I still don't really get. The only thing that could, um, the only way that I could see that happening is if somehow on Rhizome 9 they had access to the alien made transportation pods. And somebody in the comments uh, made the point that uh, though, like they say it's quote unquote alien made, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was an alien species, that, that it was a non-human species that created it. Um, I guess it's you can kind of interpret it both ways. I think it's, I I think that it sounds more like um, like actual an actual alien race created the transportation pods and we just kind of stumbled upon them. I think that's the more um, realistic way to interpret that. I think it's more of a leap to think that um, like the alien race was actually referring to just humanity on a in, in a different timeline. I mean, it's an alien timeline in the, in the sense that it's a different timeline. But I don't know about referring to humanity as uh, alien. Like I don't calling them aliens because they're on a different timeline. I, I think that's a little. I don't know. That seems a little strange to me. Anyway, um. A little bit more on the alien technology that suddenly appeared out of nowhere in this game. I mentioned it in, in uh, I forget what, what fucking video number it was, but I mentioned it before, but I really don't like the sudden inclusion of alien technology to explain something that you wouldn't have been able to explain otherwise. Um, basically, what I, 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 I'm going to guess why Kotaro Uchikoshi included alien technology in the story is because he needed some way to explain how you would be able to transport to clone human beings and transport them to another timeline and what he came up with was uh, an alien made machine I really don't like that and I, I explained it in that other video but I'll, I'll briefly go over why I don't like it again um, it's because the the entire series has never made a mention of aliens. The 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 idea that aliens might be involved in the in the story at all has never been a thing in the series. It seems like like okay, um at the end of 999, 7 says something extremely cryptic which implies that 7 might have had uh might have actually been working together with Aoi and Akane to put together the second Nonary game. He says something that implies that he knew about their plan to save Akane. Kotaro Uchikoshi, um, he made a statement about that in some interview that, that he was in, where he didn't have an official answer for that. He said that he kind of just left it up to interpretation whether, um, basically there are two possibilities that, um, Either uh, Seven's cryptic remark doesn't mean anything, or he, I guess three possibilities, or he deliberately lied to um, kind of help along uh, Akane's and Aoi's plan, or somehow he had like his mind, he had like his mind erased by some kind of drug, his, or his mind altered, his, or his memories, or he had memories implanted, that's, that that's what it was. He had memories implanted in his brain that he never actually had so like those were his like possible like uh reasons for seven's remark and he he decided to just leave that open to interpretation um because he said that he didn't want to feel like he was making up random excuses which i totally understand as a writer you don't want to feel like you're making up random excuses for something and that's exactly what I feel like the whole inclusion of alien technology out of nowhere. That's what it feels like to me, a random excuse to explain something that you weren't able to explain before. It feels, ran it, well, it's definitely random because it came out of nowhere, but it just feels like an excuse also. So that's why I don't really like it so much. And I, I, I really want to know what Kotaro 
Uchikoshi thinks about <clears throat> about his inclusion of alien technology into this game. I really want to hear what he has to say about that. I would love to uh, watch an inter watch him uh, or read um, an interview that he's been in about this game, and I'm sure he will be at some point. But yeah, uh, alien technology. I I'm not a f eh, no. Um, I also feel kind of similarly about Delta's mind hack ability. Um, I mean, it came out of nowhere. It's not completely out of the realm of possibility, given that shifting is a thing and the morphogenetic field. So it's not like, it's not as like totally out of left field as aliens is, but I don't like that he can control people's bodies like that. Like that seems like a little bit much, I feel. It wasn't really used much at all in the story. It was used like twice. And you could have probably written another way, an another way for, you could have probably ri uh, written around those two occurrences without having to like give Delta the ability to control people. I just think that that's too, that's too much power to give to one character. That's too much. That's a little bit too much. I feel like, um, I, I don't really fully understand Delta's um, powers. Like, he has the mind hack ability, I guess. But, again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, I think of the last video or something, but I don't understand how he knows that he's Fi's technically older brother, which is an extremely minor, minor point. Um, and I don't really get how he knows about the fact that the world is going to end. Because if he can't shift, right? He doesn't have the ability to shift. He can read people's minds, he can read their thoughts, and he can control them a little bit. But he can't shift through space-time, right? How would anybody who can't move through space-time, who cannot go back in time, know that the human race is going to be extinct. Like, how could you experience the extinction of the, the absolute extinction of the human race? How could you ever go back and like, it, unless you can go back in time, how could you ever have knowledge of that? Like, if I were to walk out of my house right now and I were to see like fire covering the sky and it like were covering the entire earth and this were like the earth extinction event where everybody dies and nobody would ever watch this video. And this video would never get made or uploaded because we're all dead. How could I possibly, unless I had some kind of psychic abilities or I could move through space time, un unless I could jump to a previous point in time or I could see it in the future, how could I possibly ever know that the world would end at this specific time and date? How could I ever know that? So that I don't really, I, I mean, it's possible Here's one possibility um, that a shifter experienced the end of humanity and right before they died, they shifted and they told Delta about it or they didn't tell Delta or they, uh, they, um, Delta read their mind. He mind hacked them. So that's how he found out. He, he mind hacked a sh somebody who shifted from the end of the world. And now that I think about it, um, Phi lived to be like 104 or something. Or at the very least, that's where uh, the file ended on Phi, old Phi. Apparently, old Phi played some kind of role in all this. So it's possible, I guess, that old Phi, in some weird way, experienced the end of the world and then jumped back in time and then Delta learned about it from her somehow I don't know I don't know but that I'm make that's a completely like wild guess shot in the dark at, a, at explaining how um, Delta could have possibly known about the end of the world Yeah, he would have had to have learned about it from a shifter. That's the only thing I can think of. 
Um, okay, so there's that. Okay, if you're, like, listening to this and you're, like, alarmed at, like, the amount, like, how everything I've said so far is negative about this game, that's because I want to get through those first so I can get to, so I can start gushing over all of the things that I loved about this game, and that's, that list is pretty long. So, let me just get through the negative shit first. Or, and this is all, of course, just opinionated, this is all, these are all just my personal opinions, so I'm not... Like, if you disagree with what I'm saying here, like, don't feel like, don't get pissed off about it. I don't want to argue about, you know, my opinions versus your opinions. If you think I'm wrong about something, you know, that's that's totally cool, but um, don't get mad. <laughs> don't get mad, because I, I know that this is a really loved series, and, like, I am in love with the series. I still am. I still am. I put all this time and effort into recording all of this shit, and then my part zero. I love this series, and I still do now that it's over. Even though I've got some problems with it, I still love it because this this is still my favorite visual novel I've ever played in my life. Still is, totally. So let me just, just try just that was just my attempt at diffusing any anger that might be building up in people watching this right now. Um, okay, so any more negatives that I can think of? Uh, oh god. Immediately my thoughts turn to Junpei. Okay, so let me let me anything. Any negatives in the overall story here? Um I addressed the ends of Virtue's Last Reward. Um, you know what? At the end of Virtue's Last Reward, I'm still... Fi seemed to know more than she was letting on at the end of Virtue's Last Reward. I still don't know what that's about, really. Um, well, actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, the only one who really had his mind erased, or, or his memories erased, was Junpei. At the end... Oh my, wait, no, that was explained. That was totally explained. <laughs> I was going to say that at the end of the Virtue's Ass Reward branch in this game, right, right here, Junpei and Akane were dead. So how the hell could they show up on Rhizome 9? But they were able to show up on Rhizome 9 because they were actually copies sent from another timeline. Copy Junpei and copy Akane from another timeline, and that's who winds up on uh, Rhizome 9. The originals are dead. Okay, so that's totally fine. Um, any other weird loose ends at the end of... at the end of the Virtue's Last Reward branch? Mm, I don't think so. Well, I guess I don't really understand why um, Akane had to erase Junpei's memories. I guess it could be she might have done it so that he would like forget about her and live a normal... You know what, that, that actually makes sense. So that Junpei would forget about her and li hopefully, hopefully, quote unquote, hopefully, at ho hopefully asterisk, <laughs> live a normal life so that she could just throw her entire existence into developing the AB project. I guess she could have, you could argue that she did it so that she wouldn't, so that the AB project would not consume Junpei's entire life as well. That would make sense. That would make sense. And that would actually be kind of a noble thing of Akane to do, I guess. But it doesn't really work out so well. Junpei still like lives his entire life and just kind of searching for Akane. And when he's not searching for Akane, he's indulging in grandpa videos. Um, hmm. I guess you know what? Now that I think about it, though, if you know what Akane <clears throat> in in uh, erasing Junpei's memories and basically subjecting him to uh, live through Radical Six, she essentially was taking like a a 75% chance that he would die, I guess, in those um, reactor explosions. So I guess she was giving him a 25% chance to live, maybe? I don't know. You might be able to explain, uh, explain that away somehow, but... Yeah, she kind of took a, a chance on Junpei's life there, I think, I feel like. Yeah, I don't think Junpei was immune to Radical Six, so he could have contracted it, I think. 
Yeah, the only ones who would have been immune would be, I think, Q-Team, who were injected with that virus that, I guess, counteracts Radical Six. I don't think... Yeah, she was totally taking a chance on his life, I think, there. Hmm. Okay. Okay, um, I guess I'll go through the characters next. Um, I guess since I'm still, <laughs> since I'm still trying to, like, like, uh, stay on the negatives here, I'll go over Junpei first. Um, I would say, like, for the first, like, 80% of the game, or 75% of the game, Junpei was just an annoying douche of a character. Um, all of his, his dialogue I didn't like at all. And I really liked the dialogue a lot in 999 and Virtue's Last Word. I, I've had very few problems with it. Um, I thought Dio's dialogue wasn't amazing, amazing in Virtue's Last Reward, but uh, it was pretty solid. Pretty solid. Overall. In this game, Junpei had horrific dialogue. I thought his jokes were just terrible. Um... And not like offensive or anything at all like that, but I just thought they were just bad jokes. Like he was just a he was just so unlikable, and I, I guess that that's what they were going for. They succeeded in making him an unlikable character, but they also made him really annoying. And I guess you could argue that the writers tried to do that, maybe. But I just didn't like it. I didn't like hearing Junpei say anything, <laughs> and I don't think that's a thing you want to include in your game. I don't think you want. To throw in a character that's just truly like universally disliked and I haven't like talked to I've, I've talked to one person very briefly on Twitter about Junpei and she uh, also dislikes him as well so and I imagine that most people playing this game are gonna hate Junpei's character too um, I guess you might possibly try to argue that they made his character so shitty and unlikable just so that whenever when the time eventually came that Junpei's character um, did a complete 180 and he... Well, not a complete 180, but where he... He came to this point in the story where he grew and he changed. Basically, um, the AB... Uh, the Ambidex fragment, I think it was, where... Um, they had that long... Uh, C-Team has that conversation about shifting. It's pretty much right after that, right after Junpei's plan to like have everyone meet up um, in the timeline where they all were executed. And he kind of like puts Akane through, um, like basically Carlos, and he, he forces Akane to live through the experience of having like Junpei and Carlos die to protect her, which is horribly traumatizing, of course. Um, it's right after that that Junpei finally stops being a douche and um, he gives Akane that ring and he stops being so horrifically unlikable. I kind of feel like um, he cursed a little bit too much. Not because I was like offended at all. I, I curse a lot as you probably, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, I curse a lot, but I, I think it was... And I guess this might be personal taste, maybe, but I kind of felt like he cursed an unnatural amount. Like... And I, this is how I felt about Dio also in Virtue's Last Reward at, at times. Like... He cur- like... Like, his cursing was unnaturally excessive, I thought. Like, I've never heard anybody, like, in real life curse like that frequently you know like i don't know it, it just seemed like that whoever wrote the dialogue for junpei wasn't really somebody who cursed a, i'm gonna guess somebody who cursed very much somebody who wasn't accustomed to cursing who, who wasn't accustomed to thinking about how like like accustomed to hearing people curse in real life or maybe the editor I don't know. And that's just completely my opinion. Uh, you people, Other people watching this game or, and listening to, to, to Junpei's dialogue might not have thought that, which is totally a valid opinion. Um, I just kind of felt like it just seemed a little odd. 
It just, it sounded a little off. Like if, if I were, if I were um, like editing Junpei's dialogue, I would have, I would have edited out like maybe like a quarter of all of his curse words. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like if you use the word fuck like in like, like this, like the, like in two consecutive sentences, like, like, I fucking love this fucking game. Like, it would sound more normal to just say, I fucking love this game. I fucking love this fucking game. Sounds a little bit odd to me. I mean, some people might talk that way, maybe, but I just think it sounds a little bit weird. I fucking love this fucking amazing game. I feel like that's the kind of amount of cursing that Junpei had at a lot of points in this game. Shut the fuck up! You fucking asshole! I fucking love this fucking game, as opposed to something more along the lines of I fucking love this game. Which I, I think sounds more natural and believable. I think. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time writing a lot of dialogue for another game that I haven't even ever mentioned in this LP called Arachnoid. That was actually the game, I started working on that in my last year of college actually, and I spent like, I think like three years working on it. I, I've written, I wrote a, an enormous story for that game. And I wrote, um, there's there's a good amount of cursing in it, and but it, it I, as I was writing all of the like cursing in it, I, I became aware that you can overuse curse words and it just overuse it so that it just sounds odd. And I was conscious of that as I was writing it. I, I tried not to overuse it, but I tried to, I didn't want to, what I wanted to do was write a realistic story in which like a character is, a, an adult character is put into a very dangerous, sudden situation. Probably they would curse. They would probably curse a lot if they're, if, if they're in a bad situation, you know? just out of frustration or fear or all of that. So I, I think I wrote um, a good amount of it, a believable amount. I think I wrote it in a realistic way. I actually haven't taken a look at that script in, in a long, like in two, like in two years, I think I haven't even looked at it like a year and a half. I want to say I have not even looked at it and I, I'm very interested in going back and taking a look at it now. And just seeing, like, just re, re like reading what I wrote all those years ago, and seeing like how my, my, my sense, my writer's sense, my my taste has changed, my opinions have changed on all that. I, I I'm very interested in doing that someday, but not for a while. I don't I don't have time for that right now. But um, yeah. So anyway, that that's my thoughts on Junpei's dialogue. I didn't think his dialogue was very well written. Um, you know, I I really don't have like strong thoughts on any other characters dialogue I don't think uh like on their on the words that the voice actors are supposed to say on the actual written dialogue itself I don't think I have any complaints um I noticed that they they use the phrase they put their lives on the line a bit I I noticed that and that like, this is just a totally just a personal taste thing, I think. But I thought that that was a little bit overused. I also noticed in Virtue's Last Reward, the phrase, on the tin, it is what it says on the tin, or so something like that. I thought that was just a weird... This is probably just a regional thing. I, th I imagine that's more of a, um... Like, uh, like a British-English type of phrase or something, but I, I thought that that was a weird phrase to just include in Virtue's Last Word, and I, I felt the same way about putting their lives on the, it seems, it sounded a little bit juvenile, I guess, put their lives on the line, like it, it sounds, it doesn't sound as like, um, like dire as the situation really is, it sounds, yeah, it just sounds a little bit juvenile, that's, Total like if you disagree with that then that's totally fine. That's absolutely just like a, a like a taste thing. My my personal taste in writing, that's absolutely all that is, so I'm not I'm not that's super minor. That is super super minor.
I just wanted to mention it since I'm thinking about dialogue right now. Um, aside from that, I can't really think of anything in the dialogue that I had any issues with. Uh, the voice acting, on the other hand, Junpei's voice acting, uh, like his dialogue, I really didn't like at all. I was not a fan of Junpei's voice acting. Um, I think it was... Yeah, I think it was by far the weakest in the entire game. Akane's voice acting wasn't great at points also, but for the most part, I didn't have any issues with it. For the most part, I thought it was fine. It was okay. Uh, Sigma's and Diana's voice acting was pretty goddamn amazing throughout the entire game. I, I can't think of any like specific parts where I had like issues with Sigma or Diana and their voice acting. Fi's voice acting was basically exactly as it was in Virtue's Last Word, which I didn't have a problem with. Um, it wasn't amazing. It was pretty. It was good. It was good. Fi's voice acting was was all right. It was pretty good. I don't have any issues with that. Uh, Junpei's was horrible. Carlos's was okay for the most part. Weak in some parts, especially like after he. Um, killed Akane and he that that horrible weak ass scream where the camera is just panning out like from the from the going up just panning out and Carlos is just on his knees and he looks up at the ceiling and he just screams <laughs> that was the weakest fucking scream ever that was so, so weak. But for the most part, Carlos's dialogue was okay, or his voice acting was all right. Um, a couple of weak parts, but not not very many. I, I can't really complain very much about his voice acting. I can't, I can't. Akane's voice acting, um, mechanical, I would put her, put her voice acting on the same level as Carlos's in this game. Um, mechanical in some parts, like I said before, it kind of seems like there were parts where the voice actors recorded, but they weren't really like, it didn't sound like they were reacting to other dialogue, which is not good in like dialogue that you're recording as part of a conversation. Like you need to, and I guess that's gotta be, I've never fucking, I'm not a voice actor. I've never fucking voice acted in my life. So I'm not like, trying to like shit on them like I'm sure it's very difficult but I'm just saying like it just seemed like and it's just got to be really hard to record um, your your lines and you're like reading a conversation and you don't have the energy of other voice actors to like feed off of you don't know you don't you can't match their tone so and I'm assuming I'm just assuming that um, a lot of this dialogue or not a lot but some of this dialogue was recorded where people were s like the voice actors having the conversation they weren't in the room together when they were recording i'm assuming i'm assuming that i don't know i have no idea but i'm assuming that um so i noticed akane's uh voice acting sounded a little bit mechanical in some parts um i mentioned at the beginning also that akane's voice actor her actress um is the same voice actress that voices uh azura in fire emblem fates and in Fire Emblem Fates, she's actually really, really good. Like, which is why I was surprised at how weirdly mechanical she sounded at certain points in this LP. But yeah, she, as a voice actress, she, from, from my experience in Fire Emblem Fates, and I've played like, I think like, no, it's like, I think close to like 250 hours of Fire Emblem Fates. I love that. I still play it. I, I love that game. It's so there's so much replay value to that game, but she is really, really, really good uh, in Fire Emblem Fates. Uh, if you want to like hear just how good she is, listen to like um, just on YouTube, search uh, Azura uh, Azura Voice or something like Azura Voices or something like that, and it should just get it, it should you should find a video of just like a picture of Azura with like a black background, and it just has like all of her dialogue pretty much. Or all of her dialogue when I think like if you marry her or something like that, but it's she's she's very good, she's very good. Just at certain points in this game, not so much. Um, 
Uh, who else? Carlos Junpei. Q team. Q's voice acting. Um, Q's voice acting is very, very hard for me to um, judge. Very hard because Q is a child, and I. It's hard for me to imagine exactly how a child would act in a situation like this. Um, I think Q is. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm just gonna say that Q's voice acting was very good, for the most part. Like the the parts that sounded like kind of mechanical, and weird. Like I can't say that a child put in that situation wouldn't sound mechanical and weird sometimes. Like that. That kind of seems realistic to me. But it sounds mechanical, like mechanical and weird. Like my first reaction to that is, oh my God, that's not good voice acting. But considering that you're voice acting a child's character in the game, you could say that that's actually really good voice acting because that's how a kid would sound. So yeah, I can't really, I can't, it, it's very just hard for me to judge Q's voice acting. I, I didn't have a problem with it really. I didn't, it didn't bother me at all. Um, maybe in one or two parts, maybe, but for the most part, no. So I think Q's voice acting was pretty solid. Um, Eric's was okay. I would put him in the same on the same level as like Carlos's and Akane's voice acting in this game. It was all right. It wasn't. It didn't blow my mind really, like uh, Sigma's or Diana's did. But it it was good. It was good. Um, Mira's voice acting. I would put her on like the same level as as Eric. It was it was good. It was all right. Maybe a tiny little notch below. Maybe, but it was okay. So yeah, the only the only like bad voice acting that I really heard in this game was June Pace. Um, everyone else was okay. Okay. Um, Anything else I can think of that's negative about the game? Anything else is negative? Um, I would really just want to get that totally out of the way so I could just be positive for the rest of the of this recording. Um, uh, I guess I could talk about the way the game ended. Um, not that that bothered me. I'm not entirely sure of because it just happened. It's so fresh. I haven't really had time to think about it and like try to piece things together. Um, I think I'm gonna put that in the positives, though. I think I'm, I'm, I'm. That's I'm pretty positive on how the game ended. I think I am. Um, all right, fuck it. I'll just get into positives now. I can't think of any more negatives. Okay. So I talked about voice acting. Voice acting was pretty good for the most part. Pretty good. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be good. Watching the first trailer for the game, I thought, I thought it was gonna be really bad, but it was actually a lot better than I expected it to be. Um, the music in this game, I, I'm, I've kind of got mixed feelings on it. I kind of am not a giant fan of so much of the music being just like remixes of other of pre-existing Zero Escape music. I'm not really a fan of that, but they did sound good. And this game, th this song right now, I love that this was remixed because we, I haven't heard this since 999. I really wanted this song to be in Versus Last Reward somehow, but it wasn't. Um, so I really like that this song is remixed, but I would like, I, I would say like, uh, if you're going to make a sequel to your game, I would say that like at least half of your music should be all new music. And I haven't looked at like the the soundtrack for this game so i don't know like what percentage was reused and what percentage is actually new but it felt like a lot of like i was hearing a lot of music that i've heard before and i kind of would have preferred mostly new stuff but it was good the music was good overall uh it didn't really stand out to me like a ton a ton i really liked the first time like the first time i heard the the music where you you're making a decision that was pretty cool it didn't really stand out to me a ton, though. I think I would probably say that I think 999 had the strongest soundtrack overall out of the three games. Chill and Rigor is a fucking great song. 
Extreme Extrication, this song, the original version of this song, great song. Uh, there was just a lot of good music in 999. Virtuous Last Reward had, I would say, a little bit less great music, but it, it had some good stuff. Um, hmm. The art, I guess I could comment on. Um, I don't know if this is just the case for the Steam port of the game, and this is a, a minor gripe, really, because it, the, I, I don't think, like, 3D models are a big... Like, if you're not going to... If you're going to look at this game and you're going to see, like, that 3D models clip and that stops you from playing this game, then you're retarded because you don't play this game for it, its amazing graphics or... You play it for the story. You play visual novels primarily for the story. That's... Like, that's the... the that's, like, 90% of the game is a story. Like, for, like, the other, like... For, like, the 2% of the game that's... Character models, like, that's... So that's, a, that's such a minor thing. But, um, yeah, I don't know if it's just the case in the Steam version, but I did notice a lot of clipping, which wasn't good, I guess. Not a big deal again. One other thing that was a little bit more distracting, and I don't know if this is the case in if you were to play this game in Japanese, with Japanese audio, but... Um, and it's just a little bit more distracting. Um, the lip syncing, especially when characters were like laughing or crying. I, I remember one part where Diana was crying. I think it was right after um, Phi was incinerated where she's crying and she's just kind of looking up, but her mouth, it looks like she's talking. Her mouth is open wide and you hear crying, but her mouth is like opening wide as if she's like speaking full words. And it just, that looked really, I think I actually laughed <laughs> when I saw that, like, as we're fucking going through this tragic fucking scene of Fi's death. Um, so that, that stuff can kind of be distracting, especially if you're, uh, like, playing through a sad scene. It can be distracting, but not major. Um, uh, aside from that, I don't really have much to say about the graphics. They're, they're pretty good. We're all right. Uh, I really like the UI. Like, look, looking at this, this is a nice looking flowchart. Like, this just, these buttons are all nice and glowing. It's a nice straight flowchart. It's all, it's crazy, but it's all nice and, I like the UI in this game a lot. I like the UI a lot. Like, looking at this, this looks really nice to me. Like, the options menu looks really nice. Look at that. Look, each one of these things has its own little icon. That's nice. <laughs> um, this was really... Well, you can't really see it, but... Um, well, actually, let me... Let me just do this, then. But you actually see, like, the character portraits in the dialogue box itself. That's... I would have thought... I would have thought that the character portraits like this were just taking up too much space in the dialogue boxes because I've actually spent time like thinking about this kind of stuff too. But it actually works pretty well. I, I, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, so just this, this, the UI is extremely nice. Like even looking at the top of the screen here where it says backlog and like the, the menu, how it's got those little blue bars around it. Like those don't need to be there. They're taking up space, but it looks nice. The back button at the bottom right, it's got a nice glow effect to it. This looks really good. Look at, look at how hot Junpei looks. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Yeah, like, look at all this. This looks really nice. Yeah, the, the UI people who worked on this extremely ext did an extremely good job on this status. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, shit. I never... Looked at this screen. That's crazy. 
That's awesome that they use these pictures too. Yeah, I really like the UI a, a lot in this game. Okay, um... I look at the background here. There's a nice, like, like shimmer effect going across the screen. Like, that doesn't need to be there. That's just a nice little touch that they just threw in there. Yeah, I like the UI a lot, a lot in this game. Um... I don't like how Akane has pink hair all of a sudden. Like, I, I kind of wish that would have uh, stayed a little bit more true to every other Zero Escape game. <laughs> um, but it's fine. Everyone looked okay. Um, I think that's all I really have to say about the art in this game. Pretty solid. Pretty, pretty solid So, uh, for the most part. Um, uh, and I guess the, the most... Like, the biggest problem I guess you could have with them is that uh, character models um, clipping. But that's really minor. Really, really minor. Okay, so I've talked about the audio. I don't really have much to say about the sound effects in this game because they were just not... I never really paid attention to them, really. Um, talked about the music. Talked about the art. Um, talked about the story. I didn't talk about the ending yet. I guess that's my next point. I guess it's the next thing. Okay, so the ending of Zero Time Dilemma. The ending to this, where at the very end, you get a final decision to kill Delta or not. And that's how, they, that's how the game ends. The reason Kotaro Uchikoshi... And you know what? I actually... As I was writing Tangent, I, I came up with a similar... I came to a similar um, conclusion about the end of a game like this involving time travel and changing the past. You want... The reason that you would want to leave the ending open-ended like that is because you want... Especially, I guess, if you only have a single universe in your game. I guess if you have a multiverse thing going on, then you don't really need to leave it open-ended. Um, but... What it does is it allows you, it, it gives you that, that sense of uncertainty. Like, um, you don't know what the future is going to bring. You don't know what to expect in the future. You don't know what's going to happen. And at the end of a, I feel like that seems to be like the, 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 uh, the agreed upon good ending for a game involving time travel, that the, the future is uncertain, that it should be uncertain. Um... I mean, everyone knows about a terrorist and they're going to try to stop this terrorist, but they don't know if they're going to stop him. They don't know if killing Delta or not would be good or bad. So it's uncertain. Um, the whole idea that Delta didn't really... Um, well, I guess he conspired to murder, I guess but that he didn't actually do anything in the true timeline. He didn't commit any crime, in the, or he didn't kill anyone in the uh, true path. That's a very interesting point, too. In that sense, and also considering that what he did actually brought about a situation in which Radical Six doesn't escape, and nine or ten or so people now know that there's a terrorist that's going to destroy the world that they're all like and nobody died that that delta's actions ultimately brought everyone to that point i think actually justifies um what he did i think it does because that's essentially what akane did she sacrificed a bunch of other universes and forced people into horrible situations just so she could save her universe or one universe um, Sigma did it in Virtue's Last Reward so unless we're going to say that both of them are bad characters all of a sudden then we can't say that Delta is a bad character There, I did, I, I did have a thought though that instead of doing all of this well, I guess maybe... Well, no. Yeah, with, with everything that Delta knows. I, I would imagine that he knows about Crash Keys, right? He's the founder of Free of the Soul. He's got to know about them. 
Um, instead of all of this, why wouldn't Delta just approach Crash Keys and tell them about a terrorist attack? Why wouldn't he just, like, because they're assuming that Carlos doesn't shoot Delta at the end. They're all kind of like allies at the end. They're all on the same team. They're all essentially trying to save humanity in their own ways. Um, I, I don't think Delta's a bad, evil character. I don't think you could call him evil. Um, or at least not any more evil than Sigma or Akane. Um, but yeah, I don't understand why he wouldn't, instead of doing all of this, why he wouldn't just approach Shifter's uh, uh, crash keys. And, well, I guess you could argue that crash keys would have never have been formed if Free the Soul never was a thing. Crash Key was formed in response to Free the Soul. And Free the Soul was formed, I guess, to spread Radical Six and save two billion lives. I guess. Um, hmm. So maybe that, maybe that, maybe that actually does make sense. Maybe. Yeah, you know what? Probably this was all necessary. Probably. I kind of, I, let me, let me retract that last statement. This was probably all necessary, just like the AB project was necessary. Probably, probably. It's kind of crazy. Um, kind of crazy. I do also like the uncertain aspect of the end of this game, where it's like, yeah, we did stop Radical Six from spreading, so there are two ways we can go now. We can either proceed along a future where the terrorist is killed, and there is no crazy, like, global, catastrophic loss of human life. We can proceed along that path, or we can all go extinct. And it's, uh, presumably, this would all just loop and repeat itself. Presumably. Um, so I guess, yeah, that, that we can just tr go along one of those two paths and we don't know which one it is. I guess I kind of like that. Um... I, uh, God damn, I really don't want to say uh, too much about Tangent's story, but after I had that rant, that 30 minute rant about time travel at the end of, I hate people driving around my house. People fuck, people fucking, I don't know what it is, but like people love driving really fucking fast in front of my house. Fucking fags. Ugh, it's obnoxious and, and irritating. Um. So anyway, I don't want to, I, I noticed that like after I recorded that like 30 minute rant about time travel, um, I realized, and I honestly, I'm being completely honest about this. I had never, until I had broken down the way time travel works, the way the morphogenetic fields work, the way shifting works, which, which I, which wasn't even a thing until this game, um, until I had broken all of that down. I didn't realize just how much the game that I had designed, Tangent, had in common with the Zero Escape series. I have something similar to shifting and something similar to like, um, yeah, I've got, I've got something similar to it. I don't want to explain too much of it because it's still in the process of being designed and it's um, I don't want to give away too much, but I, I've, I have something kind of similar to it. And it does involve people uh, being knocked unconscious. Which, I, I think, after I've thought about it for a while, that does make sense. Like, it doesn't... It serves a purpose. It serves a purpose. But anyway, um... Time travel is really hard. Time travel is extremely hard, and I guess it's kind of like... Like, it doesn't make sense. It's paradoxical. Unless you invoke a multiverse. So I guess there would have to be a lot of parallel thinking when it comes to, like, writing a story about time travel. I guess it would have to be. 
but um, anyway, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into that anymore. Uh, let's see. What else? What else can I comment on? Okay, here's another thing I can talk about: the fragmented uh, design of this game. At first, I wasn't a huge fan of it because it made following what was going on in the story confusing. I know, but that was the point of it, though. So it accomplished its goal in being confusing and hard to follow. I just, um, I guess I just don't like being confused. <laughs> I like, uh, try, I like, I like, uh, trying to follow things along and trying to figure out things for myself. And I kind of f felt like just how everything was so fragmented, it just made it really hard, not impossible, but really hard to like piece together what was going on. Especially early on when you only have done like maybe two or three or four fragments. Um, but I, I mean, it was it was good in that like it 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 it, um, it divided the game up into very like manageable chunks. It made it not that Virtue's Last World was unmanageable because you could save anywhere. Yeah, I guess that that really isn't that really isn't a thing since you can save at any point. You don't really need to break up the game into little pieces. You would if you could only save, like, uh, like if you're just looking at this menu here. Then that would be a good thing, but not not so much in the, in the case of visual. Most, like... Actually, you know what? I don't think I've ever played a visual novel that didn't allow you to just save at any point in the game. Okay, so... Yeah, I, I didn't mind it. It was part of the it was part of the way the game was intended to be played, and um, I, I recognize that, and I'm I'm not like disparaging that, but I I just didn't like how confused I felt at the very beginning. Once, like, okay, I'll put it this way: once I once I finished my first branch, I don't remember when, but once I finished my first branch, and I could follow the timeline from one from the beginning of the timeline to the end of one branch I got I felt really excited I felt really good like I really knew what was going on that's why like so often I would go back and check the the, the global flow chart and I would just see okay so what happened before what happened next what led up to what I'm seeing now so that I can understand this cutscene but I'm seeing better I did that so much because I want to understand this I don't want to be confused and the fragment, the, the the fragmented design of this made it harder to understand. But I understand again that that's what was intended. So I guess I could talk about. I could also, I guess I could also talk about um, just the the shifting ability in general. That's something I didn't really talk much about specifically. Um, And creative control, I guess, for the writer. The zero, zero time dilemma specifically gave the writer a, a huge amount of control, a gigantic amount, way more control than 999 did. The only like um, real like use of the morphogenetic field that Junpei like used, like that actually helped him on the correct path. The only like major use of it was when he got the safe combination and that was pretty much it. Like all throughout the, the true path, it's not like Junpei like was getting memories from other timelines. I mean, you had as the player, you had memories of other timelines because you played the game. But um, Junpei himself wasn't suddenly learning all of these things that he could not have possibly known about. Not so much. And not so, not the most blatant uh, use, the most blatant, uh, I guess, application of that was when he suddenly knew the combination to the safe. And that was fine. I just kind of feel like that was used a lot in this game. A lot, a lot. And, um, like, I, f I kind of felt like people were, like, cheating like a lot more in this game than they had in Virtue's Last Reward or in in 999. Like the only really like thing you could possibly call cheating, I, I think, that I can think off the top of my head in 999 is when Snake took off his bracelet by like uh, 
by like uh, um, compressing his hand in so that he could slip it through the bracelet because his left arm is uh, a prosthetic. That's the only thing that I can think of right off the top of my head that I could count as anything that could be considered quote unquote cheating. In Virtue's Last Reward, I would say it's when Sigma, after he was injected with Tuber Cura Rain, um, put his hand under the Nine door and he kind of just like smashed his own hand. And that's how he removed the bracelet. I guess you could kind of consider that quote unquote cheating. Like, not cheating, but not cheating so much, but like getting around the rules. I'll, I'll put it that way getting around the rules. Um, I didn't feel like it was used very much in Virtue's Last Reward. I didn't really. S I, I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong because I, I haven't played Virtue's Last Reward in a while, but I just felt like it was used a lot more in this game. Like with D Team. Just taking that bomb out of um, out of the, the robot room or whatever that was, and blowing up a wall, <laughs> uh, uh, just a random wall. Well, not a random wall, but just blowing up a wall so they can escape through the decontamination room. And Zero, even like that's the first time in the Zero Escape series that Zero, I think it's the first time that Zero actually intervened and said that they were like breaking the rules even though they, I don't think they were technically breaking the rules because I don't think Zero actually mentioned that you can't you <laughs> blow up walls, I don't know. But like is that Zero himself interve intervened and um, basically changed something so that, uh, well he put Q-Team in the, in, in, the, uh, in the adjacent room basically, he put Q-Team there. Um, which actually was a lie now that I think about it because there was only ever one decontamination chamber. So Zero lied. Wait a minute. I think there was only one. I'm pretty sure there was only one. Well, he might not have put them... He might have put them in an adjacent room. He might not have, I don't remember exactly if he said he put them in the decontamination chamber adjacent to the one that they had planted the bomb. I don't know if he said that or not, but. Um, and there's also the, the, the whole thing where like every each team's time was off, which was intentionally misleading. Like it, it was like, it, okay, if, prog if, if Zero programmed all of their watches, right? And he deliberately um, made their watch, like made two teams' watches like uh, inaccurate. Then I would say that's that's extremely close to lying to them. Like it's it's deliberately, deliberately um, deceiving. It's deceitful. And I don't really like the idea of. And I, I mentioned this before, but I don't really like the idea of the person who's controlling everything directly like lying or deceiving to the people that are being controlled that are the people that are playing the decision game i don't think zero ever explicitly lied in virtue's last reward or in 999 akane lied and aoi lied to keep everyone from finding out who they really were but zero didn't specifically zero whenever like whenever zero would give like a message or something or whenever he would speak through like the the loudspeaker. I don't think he ever lied. So yeah, the, the, I don't think that the person in control of everything should ever lie. I don't think. I don't know. I'm not I'm just not really a fan of, of the lying. Cause it kind of it 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 makes it so that the player can't correctly guess things or are they are there it, it pushes the player towards the wrong decision. It pushes them towards doing the wrong thing. And I'm not really a fan of that. Uh, you know what? Okay, I'll say, I'll put it this way. There's a difference between um, deception and misdirection. I felt like in the previous two games, misdirection was utilized very, very well. In this game, it was utilized very well, but there was also deception by Zero that I didn't like, that I don't think was in Virtue's Last Word or 999. Like, I, I just, just misdirect the player. Don't deceive them, just misdirect them. That's it.
Like, I, I I'm a fan of that. <laughs> I'm not a fan of deception. Um, I really liked how um, at certain parts you weren't given new fragments or new spots in the timeline that you could just jump to. The game forced you to piece together things and to solve not really puzzles but to like solve riddles I guess yourself like who's like what Zero's real name was or what Q's real name was which Q's real name I don't well you know what to come to think of it yeah that was never Q's name in that in, in this cutscene down here I had assumed that I needed because I couldn't just input Q I couldn't which I don't really understand. Why, why wouldn't you be able to shoot yourself? You could shoot Eric, Mira, or you could not shoot. It would make perfect sense that the only other option would be to shoot yourself. But that isn't the case. I guess Q can't shoot himself. I don't know. But you can shoot Delta. Like, and that I had to figure out that Delta was the fourth choice, even though this was extremely hard to figure out, I think. I think this was extremely hard to figure out. Even though that was hard to figure out, I liked that I that the game didn't just hold my hand and, you know, it wasn't that easy. Like, th I feel like figuring out how to progress, progress in the game, uh, in this game, it was harder to do in Zero Time Dilemma than it was in Virtue's Last Reward. Not in 999, though. 999, I, I think, was actually the hardest, but that's because I think of a design flaw in 999 in that you it didn't have a flowchart for you to look at. Like the whole thing of you knowing that you're supposed to take the bookmark from Santa and you're supposed to give it to Clover and you're supposed to listen to their to Santa's and June's explanation about nine or ice nine like that you're supposed to do all of those things and go through specific doors to get to the true ending like that's not even hinted at at all. That um that was uh, not good design, even though I love the game. Like, you would just, like, for you to just blindly, like, like um, find yourself on the true path like that, for you to just, you pretty much have to Google it. Like, once you get the, once you get uh, the wrong, like, uh, like three of the bad endings, and you've gone through all the doors that you can go through, then you pretty much have to just resort uh, to Google to find that out, but I didn't have to in this game, except for that very... You know what, no, I even like to just type in Delta, that Delta was the fourth uh, character there. I could have figured that out if I had... Um, well... You know, I'm not sure, now that I think about it. Because that whole idea that Delta was... Um, like just the invisible other, the 10th player, the invisible 10th player. Um, we only first heard about that when we were like pointing out who Zero is. And Q pointed that out. Um, I don't think, like from that, I don't think you could like um, fairly assume that that meant that Delta was part of Q team. I don't think you could make that uh, assumption. Realistically, fairly make that assumption. Just based on that one cutscene. Hmm. You know what? I, I think I'm pretty much out of things to say. I don't know what else I could really say, but I haven't already said in a previous video. And I, I know a lot of the stuff that I have said in this recording has just been like reiterations of what I've already said, but. Um, I think I'm out of things to say right now, I think. I think I've done everything in the game, pretty much. Um, okay, so just to, just to really quickly reiterate this last point, since this, this is the end of the Zero Escape series, I assume, <laughs> I, I, I don't see why there would be a Zero Escape 4, but I guess that hasn't, I don't know if that's been, um, uh, I don't know if that's been um, confirmed by Uchikoshi or not, but um, the very end of this game, how it's the very end of the Zero Escape series is open-ended in the way it is. I like that. I do like it. Um, 
it, it that really just seems to be that the way people handle time uh, time travel stories the f like we're not supposed to know the future you know the future is unknown anything could happen we could do anything that's the kind of message I think that Uchikoshi is trying to convey at the end of this game and I, I've seen that message um, a few times in other in other graphic novels that I've played dealing with time travel so uh, okay I'm gonna just cut the recording here um, you know what there is one more thing that I almost forgot again to say and that is this if you have watched this LP and you haven't played the game for yourself and you don't own a copy of the game for yourself if you enjoyed the LP or you know what even if you didn't enjoy the LP if you hated me if you hated this whole series <laughs> um, please support the developers and buy the game I know that it probably won't be a Zero Escape 4 but it um, you know what there might be another you know what Uchikoshi might come up with another amazing series for us to get all excited about and that would be amazing I would love I would love another series another zero escapey kind of series another time travel craziness series by Uchikoshi I would love that so um, if you can afford it if you've got the money to spare um, please support the developers if you enjoyed the game, even if you didn't enjoy the game, do the right thing. Support the developers. Um, buy the game. Okay, um, that's. I think that's that's everything. What time is it right now? It is 11, 12 p.m. July 14th. I started this LP about two weeks ago. I wanted to get this all done in a week, but... It was fun. This, this was. I enjoyed this this game a lot, a lot, a lot. I hope you guys enjoyed the LP. Thank you guys for watching. Um, I guess <laughs> uh, if you haven't done so, please like, feel free to comment, subscribe, all that shit, and stay tuned for what's coming up next. Um, today is what Thursday. I'm actually going to be busy this this weekend. Um, Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to be hanging out with my brothers. We're going to be watching the Evo tournament. Do that every year. Always good times. Um, so Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to be busy. But tomorrow, I'm not. And I'm going to upload the rest of this LP pretty quick. So tomorrow, I'm going to start my LP of The Last of Us. And because I'm not going to have any uploads for Saturday, Sunday, I kind of need to ration those videos to last me until I guess Sunday or Monday or whenever I have the next chance to record but from here on out um, I'm gonna be doing one 30 minute video per day the last of us uh, after the last of us I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna do after that um, I've had somebody somebody suggested that I, I could do another visual novel I'm not opposed to that at all I actually haven't really thought about it very much until uh, that comment. I have a few visual novels in mind. Oh, you know what? I totally forgot. At, at one point in this LP, I mentioned uh, some other visual novels that you guys should check out. Steins Gate. If you like this game, watch the anime. I would suggest in Japanese with subs, because I think that's much better than the English dub. I don't really like the English dubs in Steins Gate, but Steins Gate is amazing. Uchikoshi worked on that as well. And ever 17 check out that game that that game is you can he, uchikoshi i think he co-wrote it with somebody else but you can definitely see uchikoshi fucking influence all over that game um ever 17 and i think never 11 i think the entire like infinity series is probably pretty good uh i've played through ever 17 and it was fucking amazing uh i haven't played through never 11 that's one I'd consider doing an LP on, but I don't know how I would get a legit copy of that game. Uh, I think it's on Xbox 360, a system I don't own. Um, and I don't know if it was released in English on PC. So I'm not sure if how I would do that, but I, I could potentially record Steins Gate if I were to get a, a PS Vita or PlayStation TV. I could do that. I also have been kind of 
wanting to do an LP, and I guess I would need a, play, a PlayStation TV for this also, of Persona 4 Golden. I played through that game a couple of times in the past. I haven't played it in a long time, and I really like it a lot. I love the Persona series. I've only actually played Persona 3 and Persona 4, and I'm definitely, as soon as Persona 5 comes out, definitely do an LP of that game. Um, most likely on PS4, most likely. But that, that's a ways off. I think that comes out on like uh, Valentine's Day of 2017. So I would kind of like to do a Persona 4 LP before that happens. I, that would be fun, I think. Um, but yeah, if you if you guys have any suggestions, um, feel free to leave them in the comments. I, I, I read all of your comments and I respond to almost all of them. Um, so if you want to suggest anything, anything you know you think I might like, just feel free. Um, but yeah, most likely, unless unless somehow I'm struck by some kind of inspiration to record something else tonight, which I think is very unlikely, I'm going to be recording The Last of Us tomorrow. Um, I've never played it. That's going to be a totally blind LP for me. I've heard nothing but great things of The Last of Us. I know it's got, it was like, it's got a ton of awards that it, like it won, but um, never played it. I should have played it a long time ago, but I never did. So I'm going to be recording that tomorrow. So once again, thank you guys for watching. Um, hope you enjoyed the LP. I really do. It's been really cool talking to you guys in the comments. This is um, the most commented on LP that I've ever done on YouTube, I think. I think this is probably the only thing that really came close to this was Dead Space 3 on my old channel a long time ago. But you guys have been really cool. I've, I've really had a lot of fun talking to you guys in the comments. Um, so thank you guys for that. Thank you for the, all the support. Again, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, stay tuned for The Last of Us, most likely, after this. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks again, guys. Laters.